Welcome to Perspectives El Paso. I'm Professor Leon Blevins, Professor of Government at El Paso Community College. I want to begin today's program with just a little bit of history about my situation of coming to El Paso Community College, and then I'm going to introduce our guest, our special, special guest. About 1971, I was in Amarillo, Texas, and I was teaching at West Texas State University in that area, and I was reading in the Congressional Record an obituary of a man named Joe Yarbrough that I had known and actually worked for here in El Paso back in the 1960s, 65, 66, 67, somewhere in there. And in the obituary, it mentioned that he was on the Board of Trustees of El Paso Community College. I didn't know there was such a thing. So I contacted someone here in El Paso, was uh, uh, recommended to teach here, ended up being employed. Then one day I was in my office, about 1971, and the, uh, a colleague came to my office and said, did you see this morning's Amarillo paper that Preston Smith has vetoed hundreds of thousands of dollars for the college you just signed to teach at? And I read the article and I was somewhat shocked. So I communicated with people here in El Paso and was told that the voters here had created the college, elected a board of trustees, and then voted against taxes to pay for the institution. And the governor said, if the people of El Paso don't want to pay for this institution, the state taxpayers should not be paying for it. So I ended up coming here in a very uncertain situation. And as I was driving into El Paso, I heard on the news that the bond issue had failed and or was fixing to take place. And the voters were calling in and wanting it to fail. And it did fail. So we had to wait two more years to vote on this college existence. So I can look from back then up to this time. My perspective is from 1972 until today, 2009. The gentleman I have on the program today is new to El Paso Community College, and he's working as a marketing specialist for us, but he's been in El Paso a long time. His name is Jim Heine, and Jim is going to bring some perspective from here, looking back and what he's found out about us. Jim Heine, welcome. Thank you very to much Perspectives for having me. El Paso. I, glad to have I you I respect here. you very much and very glad to be on your program. Uh, you've told me in the past that you watch this show on a fairly regular basis. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, Jim, you called me and asked me if you could be on the program. This has happened to a few people. They've contacted me and said, I want to be on your show. Why did you want to be on my show? Uh, I wanted to be on your show uh, because I wanted to talk about what a great place El Paso Community College is and the rich history that it has. Mm -hmm. Uh, I just started here in April, uh, and one of the first major projects that was handed to me, well actually first let me say that to learn about the college while I was sitting in my office on my first day of employment here, mm -hmm. I go onto the computer onto the epcc.edu website and clicked on history to read about the history. And I noticed the first line says it was created by a vote in 1969, so a trigger went off in my head going, that's 40th anniversary stuff. Right. And so from there, it rolled to talking with uh, one of the people in the president's office here, and things started to roll, and I began to research the history to do many things with it from come talk to you about it, uh, we have many things on our website about it, uh, just to get the word out about the history and um, how great the college is. And a 40th anniversary is a great milestone. To talk about. Now you come from media. Tell us a little bit about your background in media in El Paso. Um, I've been in media in El Paso for more than 30 years from a uh, broadcasting major at UTEP, uh, 20, more than 20 years at Channel 4, the second half of those moving into the PR marketing side of things where I started off in production. And then the last five years I was at KCOS Public Television, who's housed right next door to where we're doing this interview. And so I heard about this job in marketing and from the day I walked in the doors here at case at uh, to KCOS here in this building at the Administrative Services Center, I just thought, man, this is a great place to work. And so this opportunity happened. I applied for it, and luckily I was hired, and and now I'm here. So you just moved down the hall. <laughs> I just moved down the hall, basically, right? Well, mm -hmm. we're glad to have you aboard. Yeah. We certainly yeah. are. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, now that you're here, tell us about some of this perspective of history that you've been discovering. What have been the most fascinating things you've uncovered? You're kind of like a detective. What did you uncover? Well, you you went to the main point right in your introduction was that the college was voted for but no money was voted for mm -hmm. and that is just a remarkable thing uh and that showed uh well i actually put up a red flag on a law in texas that later on a couple years down the line uh the college along with 
another entity here in Texas went to the Supreme Court to have changed where if it's a tax, only a property owner could vote for it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure how many other communities, states around the country even had this law. Uh, so that was a remarkable thing. And, it, you know, a lot of people don't realize that, you know, El Paso Community College is there in the history of the Supreme Court mm -hmm. because we were part of a suit against this law and it changed and it allowed monies to come in to the college after that. Right. I think I want to share a little bit of information on that. Of course, I'm a teacher. This is not a teaching class television show. This is basically a conversation show. Uh, but I did pull up some information on that because I was deeply involved in the bond issue September 1974 under that law. Under that law, you had to be a property owner to vote in a local property tax bond issue. Uh, Non-property owners could vote also, but their vote did not count the same as property owners. You had to win a majority of the property owners' boxes, and if you won the non-property owners by majority, you didn't win. As it turned out, Blaine Nelson, I want to give a little credit here. Blaine Nelson, helped, he teaches government still here at Community College. He coordinated countywide that particular bond issue election. I worked the east side coordinating that east side. Margaret Langford, a political science teacher, had been on the board. She coordinated part of it. And here are the numbers. Listen uh, just briefly to these. Uh, in the uh, property election for a maintenance tax for this college in 1974, the property owners voted 9,614. Yes, no, 9,734. So they won by 120 vote. The non-property owners, the vote was 2,026, no, 370, for 1,656. In other words, 1,656 renters voted yes, we want the community college and a tax to pay for it. The property owner said no, just by about 120 vote margin. So we were told we lost. So Ed Dunbar and Mark Berry, lawyers for the college, attached the case, got the Supreme Court to accept it, to a case from Fort Worth on a similar bond issue, and it went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court overturned this law. We and our lawyers were arguing, we non-property owners at that time renting were taxed by pass-through. The rent went up if the taxes went up. So we in really were paying taxes as well. So that was the basis of the Supreme Court decision. We made history. Yeah, and that's, so that's a, something that people might not know. Right. You know, that they, they, it, we were involved in a Supreme Court decision that changed a law in the whole state of Texas. Right. right. Okay, what other fascinating thing did you find out about? Oh. Um, well, the, just the whole history of, of the early days that people don't realize how many people were involved. Uh, the first class, I should say classes, were held in the fall of 1971, spread around different high schools, uh, only evening classes, obviously, because high schools were still in, uh, and because they did not have the funds to, uh, you know, have a campus of their own because of this bond uh, election problem. Uh, so, but it was, it was a whole series of events from mid-1964 on till there before the, the classes even started. I wanted to give, um, uh, say something nice about uh, Dr. Ray Small, uh, past professor at UTEP, mm -hmm. then Texas uh, Western College. Uh, he was one of the people in 1964 that had the foresight uh, to, hey, we have to do something here. We have to get people prepared for the next step, you know, UTEP or, you know, graduate colleges or whatever. And along with a lot of business leaders, uh, they sat down and started to figure out what do we have to do. And the next step after that was a very important man who is still luckily with us, who was just here uh, at the school a month ago, uh, Senator Joe Christie. Mm -hmm. He was the next person who just is a star in my eyes of getting this college off the ground. Through his work at the Texas State Senate, he was able to find ways to uh, get monies for us after the college was created but no taxes were done. Um, he worked with people in Austin and uh, found ways to get a classes started and if we had students here then the state would give us funds based on how many students we had and funds would come in. So he was able to even very grassroots but get things starting to go and then luckily 
uh, thanks a lot to uh, another person, uh, very important, the first uh, Board of Trustees Chairman, Joe Foster, who had some connections uh, with people at Fort Bliss that got us our first campus the following year in 1972 at Logan Heights. Mm -hmm. And those so were, those three people to me were just, you know, the most important people in this whole process that got the ball rolling. When I asked Joe Christie at some point, he was running for a statewide office about that time also. And I asked him, how did, how is it that the Governor Preston Smith vetoed this money and you're still able to operate? And he said, well, we hid money in several places in the appropriation bills and he found some of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we still were able to get some of the money. Yeah. Plus eventually some trade-offs were made uh, with our state delegation in Austin, with some legislators from other places like Lubbock area, you vote for my projects and I'll vote for your projects. So mm -hmm. they were able to finally get some people to vote for El Paso Community mm -hmm. College funding. And another thing that I was not aware of until uh, we had a function in August, uh, it's called the general session, people not in El Paso Community College wouldn't know what, what that was, but it's uh, where they welcome back all the teachers. We have a little luncheon mm -hmm speeches and a good time for everybody you know to get everyone juiced up for the coming the coming semester and i got to meet for the first time arturo lightborn who wasn't on the original board but he was on the second board he came on in 1971 and he told me a story of even though it was a small amount of money all seven members of the board of trustees took out five thousand dollar loans for money for the college, and he told me how angry his wife was at him. That was a lot of money back because then. Because he was only ma he said he was only making around ten thousand right. dollars a year, right. and there they all were taking five thousand dollars out. So even the board of trustees took money out of their pocket just to get those first. And it was nine hundred and one students in nineteen seventy one, spread over six high schools around uh, the city where the first classes began. That's what I call vision. Mm -hmm. They had vision. Yeah what could be done. Mm -hmm. A number of us also were involved uh, at some point, I think it was 1976, uh, as campaign managers for Arturo Lightborn and a man named Karam and a man named Prendergast that were running for re-election of the board. So a number of us were involved. Uh, one day, one of my colleagues, I asked her, she asked me this question actually, she said, aren't you excited about teaching at a new institution and you can become a part of it from the foundation? I came the second year of actual classes. I said, it is very exciting but it also was a matter of growing pains. You want to talk about some of the growing pains you discovered in your research? Um, well, the, the growing pains uh, that I really discovered, uh, first of all, of course, was that first year. They had small offices in the back of uh, Thomson Hospital where they were actually housed in the nursing facility where in years past, uh, nurses could live on the, the hospital grounds mm -hmm. and that no longer was used and so that's mm -hmm. where the offices were and I stories from uh, an employee who's one of the oldest uh, working employees here uh, Julie Bustamante yeah. who started in August of 1971 before the first class even started in uh, the offices over there and how their complete filing cabinet system was an expandable cardboard thing on a chair. <laughs> and that was the, the complete files of all the faculty and staff of the college was just in that and was sitting on a chair. It wasn't even a, a filing cabinet. Mm -hmm. um, other things that were interesting that I found out in my discovery uh, was the um, Logan, just the Logan Heights facility by itself, how First of all, when it first opened, everybody was just so happy. You know, finally we had a campus. That was a deterrent to people registering going, you don't have a campus. How do you have a college? You know, the students didn't understand. Uh, so first of all, having that there, but uh, talking with a lot of people who were there since that time, uh, their memories weren't of education, weren't of, uh, you know, people there. Their memories were of rocks. The rock I've, I've had more people talk to me about rocks, right. uh, breaking heels, uh, and, you know, just because of the lay of where Logan Heights was, you know, it wasn't meant to be a college campus. That's close to where Chapin High School is, is today. Today, right. And having to walk on rocks, and mm -hmm. that was a big, big thing to them, something they didn't like. And so finally, I think the rocks played a very important role 
with the bond election because it got all the students, all the yeah. faculty, all the staff out there beating on doors. They were ready to work. They because they wanted a real campus. That's right. And so uh, it's funny to say, but you know, rocks played an important role in <laughs> today's El Paso Community College. I think a couple of those also. You told me uh, in your office recently. They also talked about streakers. At Logan Heights. <laughs> the few people that I've talked to from back then, that's also a common threat. Was that was the time back in the '70s when that was a popular thing. There was a hit song on the radio, and and people were taking their clothes off all over the place. And there was one event. Um, I'm sure it happened more than once, but there was one organized event uh, done by some students where they all crowded into a van, opened the back door, and just started to go. But it's funny how the administration knew about it, but didn't stop it because, you know, everyone knew about it, office workers and things like that. And it was just a, a fun memory yeah. of, of the early days of, you know, before, you know, you know, when it was a lighter growing, moment, it was a lighter moment <laughs> during a, a very struggling time where you're going into old army barracks, right. trying to get an education. And, you know, that has a lot to do with, you know, how well you learn, right. you know, your conditions, your surroundings. So, you know, it's it's funny what employees from back then who are still with the college remember. You know, it's not that person or that yeah. person that's rocks and streets. Well, that's indelible yeah, to me because yeah. one day yeah. Dr. Dick Hardy that taught history and I were walking out of our building. And just as we walked to the curb, here was this van. The back door opens and here come these naked men and women, young naked men and women jumping out and running down the street. <laughs> And Dick asked me the question, do you recognize any of them? And I said, well, no, when I see them in class, they all have clothes on. I don't <laughs> recognize them from the back. <laughs> so that was a light moment in, in serious times mm -hmm. and getting the college going. Did you find out anything in your research about programs being developed and the difficulty of getting programs developed? Um, well, the, the one thing that stands out wasn't so much the difficulty, but probably the one program that started back in those days that led to the growth and um, the success of the college was the Allied Health, Health Program. Right. And uh, with, uh, with donations from Project Hope, if people aren't familiar with Project Hope was, it was a, uh, an international organization uh, where a complete hospital and all medical facilities were on a ship and it would travel to poor and undeveloped areas to, to give medical attention to people. And uh, I'm not sure who the contact was here at El Paso Community College, but they donated a mass amount of equipment mm -hmm. to uh, El Paso Community College and, this, and also some funds. And this allowed them to acquire the building downtown, which is now the Rio Grande campus. I think it was owned by the El Paso Independent School That's District correct. at the mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm and got this building and all that equipment went in there and still to this day that is the main area for any allied health any uh medical programs that we have come out of the rio grande campus right, right. now right yeah. I, I don't want to get a name wrong but i believe the administrator was named johnson who came down and, and she's told her story before in helping to put it together if i got her name wrong i, I apologize but that was one that that was going uh, what other areas did you find that you found fascinating? Um, uh, there was a lot of behind the scenes work uh, dealing with the Trans Mountain Campus, which was very interesting. Uh, the land where the Trans Mountain Campus is, this was right when they were first putting in the North-South Freeway there. And uh, the area to the east of it was known as East Kastner Range. It was still owned by the military. And then uh, the, what is still there now is known as West Kastner Range. And they had cleaned up the land enough. That's why you never see housing on the west side is because they're still worried that there's unexploded ordinance there or whatever. Uh, but the east side, they cleaned up enough where people wanted to develop that land. And so it almost became a battle between the city of El Paso and uh, the board of El Paso Community College to try to get this land. Um, 
the city wanted to use it for something to do with monies they owed and trading land with land someone had mm -hmm. up in Cloudcroft. And it was a whole mix of what exactly they wanted to do with this land uh, to make money for it. And the community college wanted the land to build this campus, Trans Mountain, the Trans Mountain campus. So the city seemed to have the upper hand at the time. And so uh, Joe Foster, the first board of trustees chairman, and uh, Dr. Alfredo de los Santos, the first uh, president of the college, uh, got uh, in with uh, Hillary Sandoval, who was the head of the Small Business Administration here in El Paso. And luckily at the time, this was during the Nixon administration, and Hillary Sandoval was at the time one of the few Republicans in El Paso, because back then they were very few and far between. And so he was very good friends with Senator John Tower, the Republican senator from Texas. And they went up to meet Senator Tower and told him what they wanted to do. And he walked right in an office right next door to the, the military who had this base and walked right in and said, El Paso Community College is getting this land. And the city was out of the picture. Mm -hmm. And we acquired that land that is now Trans Mountain Campus. House of 5,000 students yeah. about. But Dr. De Los Santos was able to get a contract with the U.S. Army to lease those barracks for like five years first. I think mm -hmm. General Shoemaker, or Shoemaker mm -hmm. uh, was at Fort Bliss. And then we didn't have this building, uh, the, the first building, the Valle Verde campus built. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they got an extension for a couple of more years. We moved into Valle Verde, I think, in 78. 78, fall of 78. Mm -hmm. And it seems like that uh, Governor Bill Clements vetoed some of the money for Trans Mountain Campus and they had to delay some of the putting of the equipment into the building. Part of the, and well, that's why it opened in 79, because the original plans in the mid-70s was that, was that both campuses were going to open at the exact same time. Right. And uh, so that's why Trans Mountain lagged a year. Mm -hmm. It didn't open until fall of 79. Right. So we had a lot of struggles, and we had mm -hmm. tremendous growth because we were doubling population of students just in the first few years. Double, mm -hmm. double, double. Yeah, I think it was not, the first year was 901, and by the second year it was already slightly over 3,000. Mm -hmm. It was even more than doubling that first mm -hmm. year. And now today we just, uh, if you saw the article in the paper, uh, this semester, our 40th anniversary semester, uh, we had the largest increase of students from year to year that the school has ever seen, 13.7%. We're up to over 27,000 students, credit students right. here at the college. Right. Do you have some other events planned for this 40th anniversary? Um, the, uh, the big event that we're going to have that's going to tie everything together is kind of a uh, look back at history with the birth of something new. Uh, we are go we're inviting back all many people that have to do with the history of the college, uh, ex-board of trustee members, uh, ex-presidents. Uh, they're all going to take part in uh, the grand opening of our culinary school. Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, this year, uh, they're just finished construction over in the other building here at the Administrative Services Center. Uh, our culinary arts program, a uh, $5.1 million uh, design, and they're going to operate their own, I like to say, I don't know if it is their own five-star restaurant. Right. Uh, it's called 1309, and uh, it, the grand opening for this is in the end of October, and then uh, it'll be open to the public Tuesdays and Thursdays for lunch and dinner, uh, and it'll be an elegant uh, it's very elegant. There'll be an ice sculpture always on display. Uh, and then, uh, well, at least for the grand opening, you'll be able to go through and tour. There's kitchen after kitchen after learning kitchen. Yeah, yeah. And also with a studio where they can, do, uh, they can do demonstrations where students in other areas can watch. And it will also be a multi-purpose studio where other departments of the college can go in and do demonstrations. If an, the automotive uh, department can drive a car and put it there and show students how to, you know, you know how to fix their car. You or should have seen the first automotive department. <laughs> I donated an old 1958 <laughs> Ford to them, and they were excited. They had a car to take mm -hmm, apart and try mm -hmm, to put it back mm -hmm, together mm -hmm. in one of those places they used to work on army tanks or something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's how primitive it was. Yeah. So we stand on the shoulders of giants, those mm -hmm. men that you mentioned mm -hmm. a while ago, mm -hmm. the people that started mm -hmm. it. 
And here we are today with what you're talking about. Right, right. And so that's our big event coming up is it's going to be kind of a 40th anniversary and then the look at uh, the future with one of our bigger uh, new programs because uh, the culinary has been there for many years, but it's a very small, very cramped. And this is going to be one of the best culinary arts programs within thousands of miles of here. It'll, it will uh, battle Scottsdale Art Institute, which is one of the more famous ones in the mm -hmm, Southwest. Mm -hmm. It will just, I mean, it is a remarkable thing. It's a lot more than just a community college cooking class. Just recently, I was in the Burgess Homecoming Parade as Uncle Sam. And as I made that route, I saw Arturo Lightborn, in fact, watching the parade go by. Mm -hmm. And a number of students were shouting out at me saying, Mr. Blevins, I'm a teacher now. I'm a teacher now. Mm -hmm. And at the beginning, at the end, two students had come up to me and said, I'm now a nurse. Mm -hmm. This, and I said, look, I just had a little bit. You might have been with me one semester mm -hmm. or two semesters, but there were a lot of other people that laid that foundation for mm -hmm. these kind of students. That's mm -hmm. what it's about, isn't it? They're our best marketing tool. Oh, yes. Well, I'll give you an example of that, too. Uh, uh, is uh, one of the things that I've been doing is I've been interviewing, as I've talked about, interviewing people from the past, mm -hmm. but also I'm interviewing people present and the future. And we're going to have a series of little interviews that are on our website, epcc.edu. Mm -hmm. uh, you click on the 40th anniversary and there's already a couple of them up there. But one of the people I interviewed uh, was a young woman named Violeta Chavez, who's she the daughter. She was one of my students. Uh, and she mentioned you as one of the most important people who she took as a professor here at the college. Uh, now, she went through the whole shebang here. Mm -hmm. She was involved in our children's college where we have students between five and 17 can come mm -hmm. and take fun classes, but in a college setting, so it gets them used to it. Right. Uh, she was involved in that, went here to EPCC, went to UTEP, and then went on to the University of Texas at Houston's medical uh, facility and now is a doctor of uh, biological sciences, I think it is. Goodness, goodness. So she grew up at this college, and when I asked her about professors, wow. and she mentioned you. <laughs> oh, <that's laughs> her mother was also one of my students, right. Paula Chavez, who works at the college. Works here, right. Well, our time is gone. What a fascinating discussion from a man working for us today, looking back and sharing with us what he learned about us. Thank you very much for being here. We will do some more programs on the 40th anniversary of El Paso Community College before this next year is up. Thanks for being with us, Jim. Thank you very much. I appreciate Great it. Great to have you here. Good luck with your job. Thank you. Tune in for another program in the future.